The reformed types can be perhaps accurately characterized as harping on covenants a lot. The joke is, yes, it's covenant this, it's covenant that, it's covenant peanut butter, and it's covenant jelly. And uh, this is not a slander. So if you think to yourself, why are we talking about covenants again? Why are we talking about covenant families? We just talked about covenant marriages last <laughs> night. Why again? Um, the answer is that this is not something that we are imposing upon the world. It's not like a structure that we think, hey, this is helpful for understanding the world. Rather, we are arguing that this is the way God has made the world. So if we dwell on it, if it feels like we're beating a, a dead horse with a stick, uh, bear with us. Uh, this is for your good. Uh, so let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you uh, that you have uh, indeed covenanted with us um, for your glory and for our good. I pray that you would help us uh, to be faithful in our callings, that we might glorify you in all things. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So beginning, not just marriage is covenantal, but all of reality is covenantal. Okay? All of reality is covenantal. What does, what does that mean? Uh, I think that we can understand this best by going again back to Genesis 1, right? Going back to how did God make the world? So a little bit of redemptive history story arc, and then we'll apply it to the family specifically. So what does God do? God makes all the world. He makes one man. This, this man is now king of creation. And then the dealings between God and creation go through that man. The dealings between God and creation go through that man. What that man does, all creation does. When that man falls, all creation falls. Right. We talked about it last night. When the curse, when, the curse that comes on Adam is not a curse on Adam, but a curse on the ground, a curse on everything. So God chose to deal with all creation through a man. He chose to deal with all creation through a representative. And this is not a quirk. This is not something he chose to do once and doesn't ever do again. He continues that throughout all of redemption history, but also continues it in, in the nitty gritty. We, we can look at other examples, uh, but, but this, this idea, Tyler gave us last night uh, the idea of a covenant, a uh, solemn bond, uh, sovereignly administrated with attendant blessings and curses. I think that's really helpful. I'm going to attack it from kind of a different angle. Uh, the covenant also means that one stands for all. That, that one stands for all, that there is a representative, and that representation is true and objective. Right? If you think about it, this is present everywhere. Once, once you start to look at it, uh, it's present in our understanding of government. Right? The king stands for the people. Right? It's even present in our, in our government as well. We elect representatives who go and represent us. What they say counts for us, whether we like it or not. Right? So, this idea of representation is covenantal. We bond, we bind ourselves together such that one stands for all. One stands for the many. That blessing and cursing flows to the many based upon what the one does. If the one is faithful, blessing comes <coughs> to the many. If the one is unfaithful, cursing comes to the many. So we see this with Adam. Adam is the representative. He's the covenant head. He's the king. He fails. Cursing comes to the many. Okay. But this isn't the last covenant in scripture. Right? This is sometimes called the covenant of life. Right? When God created man, he entered into a covenant of life with him. Right? And that had certain conditions. Right? Upon condition of perfect obedience, forbidding him to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil upon the pain of death. Um, Adam fails, uh, but, but, but the story of redemption goes on, right? Uh, God gives curses, but he also gives what? He gives promise. He gives cursing, but he also gives promise. He says, the ground is cursed, but, right, and, 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 and you, the woman, will have pain in childbirth, but you will have a seed who will crush the serpent's head, right? So there will be, there will be redemption. So you look through creation, what happens? Uh, after Adam, you have a new, a new covenant inaugurated with Noah, right? God deluges the world, and then 
Noah is spared. He's the new Adam. He's the new head, right? The new, the new one, right, that, that stands for all. And we have a changing of the covenant of creation with, with Noah. Time goes on, right? And there's, there's many, many people all throughout the face of the earth, but one of them is picked, right? God chooses Abram, picks him, says, I'm going to establish my covenant with you, right? You are now my covenant representative. You are now going to be head, father of this people. And by this people, I am going to work blessing. Right? So what's the problem, of course? Abram has no son. <laughs> Dang it! Right? It was a great plan except for that. And so uh, God then provides the son. Right? And then Abram is the father of many nations after, after a fair amount of other happenings. Um, but again, Abram is the covenant head. He's the one who receives the covenant he receives this sign now, the sign of circumcision, which marks the people of God. So now, in a sense, all the people of God are his representatives. Okay. They, are, they are now, in a way, the whole nation is a nation of priests. It's, it's the one to whom blessing will flow to the many. That, that same idea, that one stands for all, that blessings to many or curses to many flow through the one. Eventually, this is sort of narrowed again, and one man is picked again, David. And God says, I established my covenant with you. You are king of my people, and you will always have a, have a son who will be king over my people. Right? And ultimately, what is this pointing to? Right? Who's the greater son of David? Well, it's Christ. Right? Who's the greater Adam? Who's the greater Noah? Who's the greater Abraham? Who's the greater David? This is Christ. Right? So, looking through all of creation, we see God beginning with making his covenant with Adam, one who fails, and then cursing flows to the many. Okay? But then ultimately, Christ is the second Adam. He's the last Adam. He's the one who's faithful where the first Adam was unfaithful, and from him, blessing flows to the many. So we see kind of all throughout Scripture this principle, this, this reality that blessing to the many flows through the one. Okay? Blessing to the people flows through the head. Okay? This is not a newfangled idea. This is an idea that is present in the very bones of Scripture and is essential to our redemption. Right? How are we saved? How are we made right with God? Right? We are bound in covenant to Christ. We are made part of his family. How is it that... Well, well what does Jesus say when he's resurrected? He says, he says to Mary... Uh, Mary, Mary comes and, and, and she sees him. She thinks he's the gardener. He says, I'm not the gardener. Uh, he, she recognizes him and he says, don't cling to me. I have not ascended to my father, but go. Go to my brothers. Tell them that I go back to my father and your father. To my God and your God. How is it that we call God our father? How is it that we call God our father? We call God our father because we're bound covenantally to the son. So we are part, we are under him. As such, we are sons of God, daughters of God. So this, this idea of covenants is not something that we arbitrarily apply to marriage, right? No, it's actually in the bones of all reality. Okay. You'll stew on it. It'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> now, looking particularly at what implication this does have for not just marriage, but the family, it is important for us to understand the marriage covenant again. So building off the foundation that Tyler gave us last night, again, this is not a contract that we draw up betwixt two consenting adults. Rather, this is a form that God has built into the structure of creation that we enter into in subjection to him. Right? And as was discussed last night in the Q&A, unbelievers are also doing the same, right? It is, it's a creation ordinance. It's not something arbitrarily implied, but it's something that, that God has built into all of creation. Okay. And so we can't draw it up however we like. There is a pattern, right? There's a pattern that God has given. We can't say, oh, let's flip it around a little bit. Let's move it around. Let's say that we'll have it arranged this way on Thursdays and this, day on, this way on Tuesdays. But, but rather, we are fitting into roles that God has made for us to do. If you will, we are playing parts in a play, right? Uh, I've been in a bunch of weddings, 
And it's interesting. You look at the groom and you think, wow, he is, he's playing the part of Christ. Right? And you look at the bride. She's playing the part of the church. They don't get to flip that. Right? He's, he can play the part of Christ well or poorly. She can play the part of the church well or poorly, just like you can play the part of Hamlet well or poorly. Right? But you don't get to decide what role you play. That was decided by God. He establishes it, and we simply are faithful or unfaithful. So we conform to the pattern given us by God, and this is husband and wife joined together, right? covenant marriage, which is to last the entire life. And what is this purpose? Again, I'm just repeating what Tyler said last night. The purpose of this ultimately is the glory of God, but how? How the glory of God? The glory of God by mutual help, by helping one another to do the work of, the, of, of subduing the earth, right? Doing the work of taking dominion. Even if taking dominion of it is taking dominion of my little three square feet, right? This is my little part of it, and I'm to take dominion of that. And so the mutual help is for the working out of, of the calling. Also, uh, the mutual protection, right, uh, as Tyler talked about. And then finally, what is perhaps more, more pertinent for our purpose this morning is the procreation, right, the, produ the production of, of godly seed, right, offspring. Right? And this can be natural or adopted, right. So God has ordered the family as a covenantal unit defined by the marriage of a husband and wife. So it's sometimes, we can, in, in our, in our uh, uh, discussion, we can sometimes say, like, well, when you have a child, then you become a family. Incorrect. The family is formed at the altar. Right? The family is formed when the vows are exchanged, when rings are passed, when the bride is kissed. Right? That's when the family is formed. And then in due time, in, in due order, as is appropriate, children come from that union. But the family, the cornerstone of the family, is the husband and wife bound together in covenant marriage. That's, that's key. And how is this set up? Again, this is not set up any way we want. This is set up according to a pattern given to us for our joy, given to us for our good. We can buck against it, but it's given to us for our good. And that is, well, as we saw, the covenants always have a head. Right? They always have a representative, the one who stands for the many. In this setup, in the, in the family, the covenant head is the father. He is the king. He stands for the many. He stands and dies for the many. He is king, and what does the king do? The king suffers first, right? The king, I, I, we were talking last night, the king is first in, last out, laughing loudly, right? He is the one who has to go without before anyone else does. So he, uh, there's, a, there's a great scene in Henry V, directly before the Battle of Agincourt, and Henry is sleepless before this great battle. He knows that they're probably all going to be killed, and the weight of all of his soldiers is upon him. And he's wandering about, kind of mixing with, with the troops incognito, but he, he is praying, and he says, little does, little does the common man know the sleepless nights of the king that give him peace. Right? And that's the picture. So the king suffers first. The king dies first. For Why? Because blessing to the many flows through him. So the father is set up as covenant head. The one to whom blessing to the many will flow. Or not. Who's a sobering thought. Who's the wife? Who's the mother? She's the chief advisor. She is the one wielding true derivative authority over the children. It's not that Papa has all the authority and Mama has none. No, it is rather that the mother wields the father's authority. He stands behind her. The children should see the father's shadow. Right, behind the mother as she is wielding his authority. And whose authority is he wielding? He's wielding God's authority. Right? It's all derivative. So the mother is the chief advisor. She's the nurturer. She wields derivative authority, true authority, right? carrying out his vision, carrying out the father's vision. And ideally, the father is carrying out the will of God. 
This is, this is the structure. Now, I think that the metaphor of a play is helpful because it allows for variance, right? Uh, it, it was discussed earlier, I, I've taught Shakespeare, I've directed a bunch of Shakespeare plays, um, and you, you can watch the same play being put on in totally different ways. It's really interesting. And one of the delights of Shakespeare is that you can interpret a role many different ways. So I've seen bunches of different Hamlets, right? Hamlet interpreted this way, Hamlet interpreted that way. Right? There's delightful variance. So no two families are necessarily the same, and yet they all conform to the same pattern. Right? That Hamlet is very different from that Hamlet. He's super moody, and that one's kind of hyper. Right? And that's right and good, but they're both playing out the same role. They're both seeking to portray, in that case, Hamlet, but in the case of the family, portraying Christ. Right? But what does Christ look like in this context? What does Christ look like in that context? What does sacrificial love for a wife look like here? Well, it's not going to look the same as it looks over there because it's different. Because it's different wives. <laughs> right? What does sacrificial love on a husband's part look like over here? Well, different from it to look over there. So there is delightful variation and yet conformity to the all, all overarching pattern, the ultimate pattern. Um, one thing that I think is important that we talked about last night uh, a little bit, um, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, you're welcome to look there if you'd like. It's uh, a wonderful passage. Um, this is Paul's prayer for the, the, the people of Ephesus. Uh, and it says, verse 14, Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom fem every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, four dimensions, fun fact, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Right? I read that in full mostly because that's a prayer that you should just be praying all the time. Right? And it's a wonderful prayer to pray for your family, over your family. Right? Be filled with all the fullness of God. To know that which is beyond knowledge. Right? These are cosmic realities. But... Actually, the part I wanted to point out was just the very first, almost the very first sentence. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. If you have a Bible like mine, you have a footnote on family. You look at it and it says, or fatherhood. The Greek word patria is closely related to the word for father in verse 14. So what is it saying? Maybe perhaps translate it more literally. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every father in heaven and earth is named. Right. So, again, patterns. <coughs> patterns. Um, we often think that God reveals himself to us as Father because that's just a nifty image that we can use to think about who God is, right? Who is God? He's like your dad, right? This can get problematic, though. What if you didn't have a dad? What if you didn't have a good dad? What if you had a horrible dad? Right? And I've heard that objection before. How can I understand God if I didn't have a good earthly father? But the order is reversed. It's flipped. The father in heaven is the pattern for the fathers on earth. Right? Fatherhood in heaven defines fatherhood on earth. So it's not like God gave us a little, a little a flannel graph to show us, hey, I'm kind of like your dad. No, no, no. He says, your dad is kind of, ought to be like me. Right. The, uh, I, think, I think Chesterton says, the, uh, the image of the sun is reproduced in all the little raindrops. Right? All, all the drops contain the same image of the sun. So when you are carrying out your duties as father, you are imaging and you are defined by your heavenly father. It's not arbitrary. But rather it is part of the very nature of the world. Where do children come in then? So the husband and wife in God's glorious and mysterious providence, the union of husband and wife produce life. The union of husband and wife produce children who, as has been said, will last forever. Okay? These are eternal beings. Lewis is, is wonderful in Weight of Glory. He says, every person you've ever met, and this applies to your children, every person you've ever met will someday either be 
a glorious splendor that if you saw them now, you'd be tempted to worship them, or an immortal horror, the likes of which now you see only in nightmare. That's your child. Your child will last forever. Empires, civilizations, cultures, nations, they are ephemeral. They pass. But this child will last forever. Just a weighty, weighty thing. Sometimes we go, why did you do it that way? Why have you set it up such that we mortals, right, that, that we, we fallible husbands and wives are stewards of these immortal realities? But he did. So what do we do? What do we do? I think one thing is this, this uh, leads us to understand the, the weightiness of this calling. This is probably the most important work you will do. Probably. I mean, I mean what, what in your vocation? And not, not to, to downplay your vocation, right? But what in your vocation is of more weight? Almost nothing you do will have eternal consequences. Probably. Now, in one sense, we are all interacting with one another. We are all pressing one another on right towards the celestial city. We are all shaping one another. Yes, but compared to the ministry you have towards your children, all the other work you do is probably less significant. This is a hard truth. Right? And we find ourselves wanting to shirk that duty in order to go off and do actually the less meaningful work. Right. Second Peter, or first Peter, I forget which, describes uh, the saints as living stones in the temple of God. Right? That we are, we are together, the church, built up to be the dwelling place of the Spirit. And we are individually the stones that build up this glorious temple where the spirit of God is. And then changing the metaphor, he also says that it grows together, right? So it's a living, growing building. But where do you get those living stones? The family is the quarry where those living stones are mined, are pulled out. So this is the way God has chosen to work. Again, he has chosen, this isn't arbitrary, he has chosen to work through biological families. He's chosen to have the union of husband and wife produce immortal souls. He has chosen that. And not only has he chosen that, he has chosen to work through family lines. How does God save? How does God save? Where are you saved? You know, you're saved by faith, right? You're saved by faith in Christ. Where does faith come from? We're told faith comes from hearing. Right? Hearing by the word of God. How will they hear if no one preaches? Right? So on the one hand, who saves? God saves. On the other hand, God saves by means. How will they hear if no one preaches? Right? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news? Right? Romans 9 and uh, 10. Um, but how much more is that the case for our children? How does God save? He saves by means. And one of the chief ways that he saves is by the means of godly parents. One of, the, one of the chief ways God saves is by the means of godly parents. Is it any less God saving? No. No, no less so when, than when the word is preached right, from the pulpit and it goes out right, and faith comes from hearing. Right? But that happens from the pulpit and that also happens at the breakfast table. Right, with your children. God saves by means. And one of the means he uses is the example and instruction of godly parents. A often a well-known verse that I think is often unnecessarily dismissed is Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, the Hebrew is a little bit ambiguous. We imply, and I think rightly the translator implies that it says in the way he should go. The Hebrew is perhaps more literally simply in his way, which is far more frightening. Train up a child in his way, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
What does this mean? It means that as he is raised, so he will be. The patterns that are set for him by the instruction and example of his parents will set his path. And when he is old, he will likely not depart from it. This is a huge and weighty thing, right? You have his or her eternity, in a sense, in your hands. Can God take a child who's on the path to hell and go, plop, plop, yes, praise be to God, he can. So it is not absolute. And yet we are talking about the normal way in which God works in the world. The Proverbs also say, I, I, I basically just read the Proverbs. Uh, I should just sit down. <coughs> That's about all you need. Um, but Proverbs 17, 20, but he didn't. Uh, Proverbs 17, 25 says, A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. Right? This is a true statement. We understand this. We've seen this. I'm sure we can imagine it. Right? The foolish son is grief to his father. Right? I'm sure I don't need to give examples there. But there are others. A wise son, as it says, uh, 1520, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son despises his mother. Again, the same basic idea. Uh, 1913, a foolish son is a ruin to his father. All of these are describing what the unfaithful son is to his father versus the faithful son. But there's another. Um, a wise son makes a glad father, 10-1, but a foolish son is sorrow to his mother. Uh, this idea that the wise son brings gladness, brings honor to the father, and the foolish son brings sorrow, brings shame to the father, to the mother, implies strongly, well, why shame? Why shame? Why is it a shame to have a son who is faithful? Don't we just say, well, you know, the way it goes. You do your best. And they, you know, why is it a shame to have a child be faithless? The implication is because you ought to have done something about it. The implication is that you were asleep at the wheel, which is sobering. And we, we, we do not like to have that weight on our shoulders. We buck against it. I remember a conversation with my dad just eh, maybe a year ago, and we were we were kind of going back to my childhood home. So we were going back, and, and I grew up in this valley in western Washington, idyllic in many ways. There was a bunch of different uh, Christian families all in this one little valley. We were all homeschooled. We all were, you know, in the same church. It was all, in many ways, very idyllic. I come back to it as an adult, and I realize that none of those families have children walking with the Lord. And I was talking to my dad about that, and it was sobering. And we were talking about the temptation, the tendency for parents with, with children who are faithless to sort of take their hands and go, ah, you know, you do all you can. And I remember my dad saying, I, he said, I cannot think of a single example of a faithless child whose parents did not fall asleep at the wheel somewhere. I, said, I, I can't, I, in, in my experience, anecdotally, I can't think of an example of a parent truly having done all they could and the child being faithless. Dad's not a robustly reformed theological person. He was simply observing. Like, this is the pattern that I see in the world. This is weighty. But God chooses to work through families. And this is, again, just to go back to the covenantal nature of reality. That's how God always works. He always works blessing to the many through the one. Right? The faithfulness of the one brings blessing to all. The faithlessness of the one brings cursings to all. That is the way it has always been. And gloriously, again, that is the way that it is in Christ. That he is the faithful one who works blessing to us all. I don't remember how long I have. Is that enough? Can we be done? I think we can be done with that right now.